two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. A 2-1 pitch. And a drive in the air to deep right field. That ball headed toward the wall. That ball is out of here. Out of here. A game-winning grand slam home run off the bat of Robin Ventura. Hey. And it's hit deep to left center. Andrew Jones on the run. This one has a chance. Home run. Mike Piazza. And the Mets lead three to two. Turner drives one to center, chasing Nimmo back to the warning track right at the fence. He made the catch! Oh, wow! The catch of the year for Brandon Nimmo! He took a home run away from Justin Turner! Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in 10, 9, Episode number 37, the Shea Hello Podcast. My name is Casey Lynn, and I'm joined by my co-host, Bill Pulsifer, former Major League pitcher, former Met, as we approach episode 37, brought to you by Roots-Recordings.com. Of course, we have our producer in the back, always doing a great job as always, Mr. Stephen White. And before we get into our podcast, Mr. Pulsifer, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, man. Hanging in there. Very good. Uh, as we always do, episode X, we go with the uniform numbers of uh, number. former Mets uh, that have worn the number. This was kind of an easy one, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I guess only one guy's ever worn it, right? Yeah, I have it right here. So if you Thank are... You. Watching on YouTube at Shea Hello Media, please subscribe. But I'm going to hold it up to the camera. There it is. 37. Casey Stengel. Casey Stengel. I have it. Bill, you remember in Queens, Stitches? The, yeah. uh, you know, the Jersey, whatever store, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, so I got this way back when, obviously, my I'm Casey, named after Casey Stengel. Ask my dad. I don't know. But I'm holding it up to the camera. He is the only Met in history to wear number 37. No other, anybody, player, man, you know, I get it. it. You know, 62 Mets manager. They had to retire that number really early. <laughs> your, na your namesake. <laughs> that is exactly right. So awesome. I just held it up to the camera. Uh, please subscribe at Shea Hello Media if you're watching on YouTube. We are all over for audio. Wherever you get your podcasts, hit follow we uh like share subscribe we appreciate it yeah bill no one else has worn 37 so that's that nobody yep, nobody that's <laughs> just an keep... easy one <laughs> yep uh and before we get into mets news and what has gone on in the last seven days since we last uh had a podcast we have a special announcement uh our next episode which will be episode number 38 we're gonna have our third special guest we had Doc Gooden, Pete Alonzo. Not too bad. Is that sarcastic? Yeah. And I'm glad to announce that we are going to have Terry Collins on episode 38 uh, next week. And I'm thrilled to have him, the longest Mets manager, uh, uh, tenure manager in history in the Mets organization. I'm pumped, Bill. Uh, there's so much to talk about with Terry. Yeah, I mean, lifelong baseball man, a uh, great, great guy. Uh, got to know him a little bit through fantasy camp because he, uh, he usually shows up at some point in time during the week and actually attends Kangaroo Court to have a good laugh with the guys. Um, great get, man. This is uh, another great guest. Uh, it's exciting. You know, uh, Shea, Shea Hello Podcast only gets uh, so far top-notch top uh, uh, guests to appear on our show. So it's pretty exciting to to have a guy that's, it's, I was surprised that when I heard that he was, you know, kind of thought about it, that he was the longest tenured Mets manager. Kind of crazy to think. But um, yeah, he's still involved with the organization. You see him on SNY and a uh, great guy. And I'm excited to, to, to have him on. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, he is the longest Mets tenure manager. Uh, and, you know, uh, he's got a lot of moments in Mets history that we'll talk about with him next week. So I wanted to announce that. Uh, you have a, a relationship meeting him. I've never met Terry, so I'm glad to virtually meet him uh, next week as we uh, we uh, have a, a good conversation with them. So subscribe now uh, to our YouTube channel at, at Shea Hello Media. Turn your noties on, and you'll know exactly when we're going uh, with Terry Collins. I'm very excited. He has his own podcast. Um, he's had some great guests. Obviously, he's been, been around in Major League Baseball and, and with the Mets, but to your point, Bill, before we talk about uh, Mets baseball, Doc Good and Pete Alonzo, Terry Collins, we don't just go for anybody. You know, we're going, <laughs> we're going for the top of the top. So I'm excited. You are too. And I'm uh, looking forward to it. Absolutely. <clears throat> so let's talk about a little bit about the current Mets situation. Um, they came back overseas from London. It was only a two game series, uh, which. I don't really understand if you're going to go all the way five uh, hours, you know, into the future, if you will, uh, <laughs> why, why only two games, but they split the series against the Phillies. Uh, and that's all you can ask for, you know, just split it uh, when you have a two game set. Uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on this international series and if, you know, baseball trying to uh, grow the game globally and also, we got to talk about that Luis Torrens play that ended the last play of the game on Sunday afternoon in London. So uh, I'll let you uh, take the floor for this one before I go. Right. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of the, and I guess it's probably why it was a two-game series, because you have to have the two days off prior and then the two days off coming back. And as we all know, baseball is not a game that's made on taking a bunch of days off. It's a game that's played on a daily basis through 180 game, 180 days, you know, 161 games, 162 games. Um, exciting. You know, the, the, the field there looked beautiful. Obviously uh, it's, it plays a little small there, uh, which I think that they kind of want anyway to, you know, bring the offense. What I kind of felt like and noticed was it seemed like to me, the majority of the crowd was, um, and yeah. I could be, look, you can't really tell if American or no, British. you're right. I know where you're going with like this. A lot, a lot of Americans that, that went over there to go, to go see the games. I'm sure there was plenty of, uh, Londoners and, and English folk and, and Great uh, Great Britain, uh, Great British uh, folks. Um, I, British folks, listen to me. I sound like an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot. Split, th there were a lot of nice. American playoff fans it looked over like there. An American, I thought it was. Look, I saw Tom Borowski, a fantasy camp member there. Jesse right. Burke, who gave my jersey, told me that he was there. We know Stephanie from uh, X; she was there as well. It seemed like there was a lot of lot of American folks that went over. Which, hey, man, great, great trip. You know, you get to go overseas, yeah. you get to go to London, and you get to watch uh, your favorite team play there. I'm sure there was plenty of Englanders there. Um, oh, there were. Yeah, I think that if they're going to do these kinds of things, I think that it's better suited towards the beginning of the season, right at the beginning, like start your start your season there and then like like in 2000 when the Mets yeah, were in Japan when, when we went to Japan exactly yeah. I think that makes a little bit more sense and um it's got it's got to be tough you know having two but, days off here and then two days off there that's four days off uh and I know as, as baseball players you want to be out there on a daily basis especially the the position players but uh the play itself to end the game exciting game you know both games were decent games uh exciting play hell of a hell of a freaking play you know just a tremendous play at first, when you saw the bat was broken and the ball, you yep. didn't really know exactly where the ball went. Was it was it fair? Was it foul? And yeah, then just the, the bat a, just exploded. Yeah, hell of a hell of a hustle play and a tremendous throw to first base to, uh, to end an exciting game. I believe the and we're talking about the Luis Torrens play, the backup catcher at that point uh, to end Sunday's game. I believe it was the first game in the history of baseball to end the game on a play like that, where the situation was bases loaded, bases loaded, one out, and then, you know, I guess a 2-2-3 two, two, double play or a 2-3 double play, would, however you want to score you. it. Right. Um, I, I, it, there is so much going on on that play that you talked about, you know, the bat, and you didn't know where the ball was. I, the, the bat exploded. I don't think I, anybody knew where the ball was right, right away. I, you know? <laughs> Drew Smith was the pitcher, and I thought at first – that Smith picked it up and shoveled it to Torrens. But upon replay, I, then I was mesmerized because he, he went out and got the ball, 
then stepped on the plate, and then made that perfect throw on the inside of the bag to Pete Alonzo. Ball, ballsy throw, too, because if you end up, you know, rushing and you make a bad throw there, the game's over yep. on the guy that was on second coming around to, uh, to, to from third to, to score. Yeah. So, awesome play. Awesome. Yeah. Really fun to watch. Glad to, glad I got to see it happen in, live, in real time. You know, it was pretty cool, but um, hell of a play. Yeah, especially how Met, Met games are going on right now. It's like, here we go again in the ninth and, you know, the whatever yeah. inning. But he got rewarded for that play. Uh, not just that play. He he has done well in his limited time. Yeah. We all knew that Francisco Alvarez, who has been called up uh, after his uh, ligament surgery in his thumb and he's back, uh, one of the two catchers, Torrens or Nito, was going to be DFA'd. Um, it, uh, so, yeah, it was Torrens. He earned it. He basically took Nito's job, and I have no problem with it. Nito was a serviceable catcher for 12 years, minor leagues included as a Met. Um, you know, I think he played just under a shade of 400 total games as a backup catcher up and down. But uh, he was the consummate pro. He was DFA'd. He was out of options. He's got over five years of service time, so he can out. He doesn't need to report to AAA. Um, he can elect free agency. But Luis Torrens, man, we talk about competition. The Mets picked him up for cash considerations from the Yankees, of all teams. Uh, I never heard of him, but Mendoza knew him from being in the Yankee right. system. And we talk about it. He, It was a competition. We all knew Francisco Everett was coming back. Torrens took that job in a short amount of time, right from Nito, and he's on the roster. So... You know, well, let's you hope that yeah. the, the you know the hot hand can stay consistent and play well. You know, it's a shame for Nito. Nito's been a, a good Met, and uh, I, I think back to all the great games that Jacob Degrom pitched over the years and had Nito behind the plate putting the fingers down for him. Or yeah, I guess that was before they had to type in whatever the hell they wanted to throw. Yeah, hold the, down, the... hold down a press B. Have your right. mouse right. Yeah, the pitch count yeah. you're talking about. So uh, it's a shame for him. Hopefully, he finds a nice landing spot. Um, oh, he will. A, like you said, serviceable, serviceable player and a good Met and a, and a willing soldier. You know, he's a he was a, a franchise guy, and uh, I wish him the best, obviously. But um, Torrance has been playing great, and you play yeah. the hot hand, and hopefully, he can continue to play well. And hopefully, Alvarez comes back and brings a little bit of a spark, like we had talked about in the past which yep. I'm sure he'll do his very best because he's always, play, always plays with a lot of energy. He plays with his hair on fire, kind of like a Harrison Bader. So uh, the last thing I'll say about Nito is I could see him going to the Rangers. As you said, you know, he was basically Jacob DeGrom's personal catcher. Yep. Um, and if Jake is picking you, you're, you're doing something right. You're doing uh, good. Yep. But Jay uh, T. Romito from the Phillies just had a torn meniscus in his knee. Yeah. I could see Nito easily going to the Phillies. And then you know how it goes. You go to the team that is your rival, and Nito's going to be a Met killer just like Murph was after he left the Mets and went to the Nets. Right. But we'll see where he lands. Uh, he will land somewhere. Um, and we wish him the best of luck, just not when he plays the Mets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... It's about seven weeks, Bill, to the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. it's, this year, they always change the dates. It's July 30th this year, 2024, is the trade deadline. The month of March, March, listen to me. The month of June is a huge month. And before the trade deadline, obviously, July is a huge month to make up to, for the dismal May that the Mets had. Now, hear me out. The Mets are... At this point, I can't even keep track. Eight, nine games under 500. Terrible. But with the new rules and all the teams making it and the NL just being abysmal, there's only a couple teams over 500. Yeah. The Mets are only three and a half games out of that last wild card. Not saying they earn, you know, deserve anything right now, but my point is, and I have the schedule right here in front of me, they have, let's say a month or seven weeks, let's say 30 games left to make up ground when you're only three games back, two in the loss. Their schedule, Bill, is the easiest schedule of any team in the next two months. And if you don't believe me, whoever's listening or watching, watching, let me just rattle off the teams you're playing real quick, okay? Miami, worst team in the league. Padres, 500 team. Rangers at Texas, under 500. Cubs under 500. Then they had the two game series at home versus the Yankees. Okay, fine. Best team in the majors, right? 
Then they're at home for the Astros, under 500. And look at this right before the deadline in July. Now we're July 1st. Four games set against the Nationals, who the Mets just swept. Then they go to Pittsburgh, under 500. Then they're back home for a three-game set or series against the Nationals. Then they're playing the Rockies, who's the second-worst team in the league. Then it's the All-Star game. I just named the worst teams in the league, basically. Wow. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but some of those teams are probably not playing up to their potential right now. You know, you talk get, about the Rangers, you talk about the Astros. Uh, those, you know, those are yeah. teams that, that could beat you on any given night. And, you know, like the Mets are looking to try to turn things around. The, those, those teams have some decent rosters and have the capability to turn things around. So obviously it's all, it's on the Mets to win the games. Yep. Uh, some of those, some of those under 500 records or 500 records might be a little, I wouldn't, <clears throat> I wouldn't expect to go in and say, Hey man, we're going to win these games. Those are some pretty tough teams. You know, obviously I, the Marlins, you got to beat the Marlins. You got to beat the Rockies. They yep, haven't yep. proven over the last couple of years that they can beat the Rockies really uh, when it comes down to it. But uh, you know, listen, it all boils down to winning games and that, that we all know that, you know, you got to win. And you got uh, you know better. It sounds than good anyone. when everybody's under 500, but some of those yeah. teams are, are not bad ball clubs. I mean, the Marlins will always and forever be a pest in the Mets' lives. You know, we go back to 2007 and 2008 when they just meaningless games for the Marlins, and they just always seem to be a pest for the Mets. So you got to play the game. You're right, but it's better to have the the less of the good teams on your schedule than you know the Yankees and the Phillies every day. <laughs> I'm I'm just going to lean towards the lesser records right now. I'm not going to say lesser teams because uh, okay. yeah. some of those rosters on those teams are bound to start winning some games. Right. And I guess by reading that schedule, the point is this is the time where the Mets have to turn it oh, around. Yeah. They, well. they're, eight, they're eight. I have to say, and let me know if you agree with me, if the Mets can get to three under 500, and, and around two back of that last wild card, around the deadline, it's almost like last year. Steve Cohen's going to have to make a decision. If they're eight under like they are right now and playing like crap, then that's an easy decision and they're going to be right. sellers. So everything that I just read, their schedule, this next 30 games is going to dictate the rest of the year. So big I decisions totally coming up. Totally agree. <clears throat> With that being said, Let's talk about one of the pitchers who has not helped the Mets this year, and I'm very surprised by it because he had a good year when he got healthy last year, Jose Quintana. He has just been a shell of himself lately, and there's a lot of talk because we've seen David Stern not being afraid to DFA people um, and buy them out you know, and pay them, like Joey Wendell, Jorge Lopez. By mm -hmm. the way, Jorge <laughs> Lopez just got signed by the Cubs. That's okay because uh, I, was, I was actually just looking uh, this morning. Yeah. Or last night, actually, and uh, saw that he hadn't, hadn't signed yet. So, yeah. so it's good for him. Yeah. So, Quintana, he's going three innings, four innings every start, killing the bullpen. Uh, out of all the starting pitchers, he's, I believe, in the bottom five. I think it's time for a DFA. Eat the money. He's a free agent at the end of the year. And bring up our boy, Jose Budo. You know, Budo didn't deserve to go back down. Um, he's been pitching well in AAA. Christian Scott's still in AAA, but they're managing his in innings as they should. Uh, I think that's the move. I have uh, just we all know why the bullpen's been str struggling. We've talked about it forever. It's the starters not going long, and Jose Quintana is a big part of that. So this is my opinion. I'm not speaking for anyone else. Not speaking for you. I would DFA Jose Quintana, and you know. Uh, bring up Jose Buda. That's what I would do. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, and we've talked about this on previous podcasts too, baseball is a strange game where you can be one season or one off season away from getting old, you know, especially as you get a little bit older, um, where you can be successful in one year and, and finishing strong like Quintana did last year and then come yeah. back the next year and it just happened, you know, uh, you, you got old. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like a little bit of life on his pitches is, is not quite where where it's been, and it doesn't look like the fastball is cutting quite as much as uh, it used to in yeah. the past. So, I mean, look, I hate to, to say, as somebody that's been DFA'd, I, I hate to say DFA a guy, but obviously Buto had been great, uh, and like you said, really didn't kind of deserve to be to, to be sent down. So, 
I think if they are going to try to compete and try to make that run that we're talking about over these next 30 games, you're going to have to have some solid starting pitching. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the move or if there was maybe a move to put him in the bullpen maybe for a, for a moment and then decide what they're going to do. Yeah, they could do that. I mean, they did that with Hauser. Um, you know, Stearns has shown he's not afraid to do what's best for the team, and time is running out. Um, but we'll see what will happen. The only uh, thing with that is, is and, I, and he, I, he has shown that, but I got to think that Steve, uh, Cohen is tired of just fucking throwing money away. Like he, at some point in time, I don't care how many billions of dollars you have, at some point yes. in time you got to say, I got to get at least something from this freaking guy. Speaking, you know? of, speaking of Steve Cohen, you reminded me, I got the shirt on. Cohen, I see that. You got to believe in Uncle Stevie. That was right when he was, you know, announced as the owner in 2021. Uh, we've come a long way. I've had this shirt for four years. I bought it right when it was announced. And, you know, here we are. Yep. But uh, as we were talking about, uh, yeah, it's a tough decision. Edwin Diaz is coming back uh, on Thursday. And they're going to have to make a decision on who's going to – they have to make a, yep. a move. Well, there's, um, definitely, there's definitely starting pitchers down at AAA that have been doing well and succeeding. So, uh, yes. You know, yeah. if they're going to try to compete, obviously you gotta you got to have pitchers, starting pitchers that are going deep into ballgames. Last thing as we're on the uh, talking about starting pitchers, Tyler McGill. Um, I didn't discuss this with you uh, at all, but we have discussed it. I, If you watch Tuesday's game, the first game back uh, from London, he struck out seven batters in the first three innings. He looked great. His American spork that he's got, he's hitting 98 miles an hour. He's, you know, big drip, cool as a cu- cucumber. Um, and then he, fifth inning comes along and he lost it. I have been adamant about this for years. Make Tyler McGill a reliever. It Make is Tyler perfect. McGill get in shape. I think he's that, out of shape. That could work too because if you're not in shape, yes, you probably are not going to go more than five. And I will say this, too, as somebody that has has, has been a starting pitcher, sometimes you have that freaking mental block that comes in when you know, okay, here I am, fifth inning, and then all of a sudden you kind of clinch up a little bit. I'm not saying that's the case or not, but I think two things. And then when we were texting during his previous outing, and that's something I did bring up, it looks like he's a little out of shape. Um, I did watch the game before I had to go to work last night, and I was listening on the way in. He was striking everybody out. Again, striking out, guys, is – it's great. It's a lot of fun, but it <laughs> uses a lot of energy and it uses a lot of pitches. So if you are struggling with your conditioning a little bit, because from what I understand, these guys don't run nowadays anymore, you know, and the way it. that a, big, yeah. a six foot six, six foot eight, 280 pounder, 260 pounder, I'm hope I'm hoping that he's running, but if you're running <laughs> out of gas at the five inning mark uh, every time, I think that – and don't tell me that big guys can't throw deep into games because there's been plenty of big guys that have thrown deep into games throughout the history of baseball. David I Wells, Bartolo could, Colon, right off the top of my head. C.C. Sabathia, you know, yep. J.R. Yeah. Richards. We can go We can go back. You know, the big unit – well, the big unit wasn't a bulking Tall. guy, but he was, you know, six foot ten. So right. I think that conditioning might be – and I think that they – and we've talked about this with the whole no batting practice thing that was going on in years past. I think that – they kind of try to monitor so much the the, the energy output that maybe yep. the guys aren't putting enough into it. I don't know. I mean, look, cause I'm not behind closed doors or seeing what's going on in workouts, but if you're running out of gas in the fifth inning, every time, I think that uh, maybe conditioning needs to be looked at a little bit. Times has changed. We all know this. I remember the days where, and, and you obviously, I'm sure you did it where players would run the stairs in the stadiums, oh, yeah. you know, up and down. What, what, that's a, the best exercise you can get. That's hard. I, I, you know, I don't see that happening now. No, I don't. I, I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't believe guys run like they used to. No, you know. And, and now look, Satchel Paige would have told you, don't ever run, you know, and avoid fried foods. He had his, right. his, his list of things, and but I think Satchel Paige was uh, was a special, special, special individual, yeah. a unique individual. Um, I think that running's always been a thing for pitchers, and uh, I hated it. But there was a time. Well, it was a love hate relationship. There was a time when you loved it, and there was a time when you hated it. Uh, obviously. <laughs> It's a lot easier to go out there and run after a seven inning performance. You know, you threw really well. It's a lot, well, a lot harder to get out there and run when you struggle. And you, but that, that gives you some time to think and hash over some things uh, about your outings. And obviously, it helps you uh, to get in uh, cardiovascular shape. 
Yeah, Max Scherzer comes to mind. He he's the last pitcher that I've seen that would run pole to pole. That you know, old school veteran. He's forty years old. He he still got it in him. You know that he would do well, he as you know. A, came from a different generation where pitchers right. ran. I just have right. a hard time believing that for a hundred and forty or fifty years that somehow baseball had it wrong, and now all these people that didn't play somehow know what's better for for the game that was all right for 150 years they did all right with with pitchers running i don't know call me to, crazy no you're not crazy to your point they were talking about the mets coming back from london you know and while they were in london give me a break 5 hours going over the pond right or let's say the mets were going to play the uh, west coast trip in california 6 it's the hours same difference right okay and they had time to acclimate you know and they're talking about and this was, I believe I was listening to Howie Rose. I forget. Um, I don't want to put names out there. So I don't know if it was Howie. I forget who was talking. But they have so many people who are on the payroll, nutritionists, uh, you know, everything you could think of to make these athletes who are human beings. They're not, you know, robots and th to take care of them, you know, hydrate nutrition, right amount of protein. It's like an MMA fight where you're you're in fight camp and everything in your body trying to make weight. No, this is baseball. You know, get your sleep, get the jet leg out of your way, you know, stay up. So like when I heard that, it's to your point. Baseball's changed. We have all these positions on the payroll on, in the organization that I, 30 years ago, we'd be like, what? That's funny. Oh. It's, it's it's funny because when I was at opening day and they were doing the announcements of everybody, it was uh, right. It was insane the amount of right. directors of this and coach of that, and it was crazy because we listen. We had a two strength and conditioning coaches and a trainer. That's and fine. And an assistant trainer, and there was it. You know, and then they have a quality control coach, a performance coach, and all this. I don't know. I think it's over analytics yeah. and. Um, I guess they think that starting pitchers going five innings is, is acceptable. I well, think it's proven that it's not. <clears throat> yeah. Well, baseball is just not the same. And that's okay. But when you have, you know, like you're saying on opening day and they, they make the announcements of everybody in the organization. When the, like, when the coaching he, pass goes the, all the way down the right field uh -huh. line to the foul pole when everybody's lining up for the national anthem, that's, that's yeah. quite, a few, quite a bunch of people on the staff. And, and the assistant to the assistant to the assistant massage person, right. you know, like, you yeah. know, freaking break so it's a lot it's just the way Sometimes it is now. when you look in the dugouts now too they're like i don't know how anybody gets around in the dugout there's so <laughs> many different people in there you know you're right the dugout used to be like a sacred sacred place where only certain people were allowed in there and it was like a no-no to be in the dugout even if you were uh yeah. you know uh, you weren't supposed to be in there now it's like I, excuse me excuse me pardon me pardon me excuse me like uh, Bugs <laughs> bunny trying to, to right, get out right. of the aisle or kramer trying to get out of the aisle in the movie theater you know you're right you're absolutely right especially now 60, uh, 60, 26 man roster, double header, 27 man roster, you know, so it's, it's just little, even it's more crowded in there a little bit. Um, we have to move to the mailbag, buddy. We got some good, we got a lot of questions and we, we're going to get to them all. So we're going to go right into it. Right. Um, if you're listening to the show for the first time, Shay underscore hello. Uh, we tweet out, send your questions to us. We will read your questions to Bill or myself or both live on the podcast, as we will do now. For next podcast, it will be all for Terry Collins. So right. we'll we'll put that out probably over the weekend, I would say, um, to ask any question you have for Terry Collins, who will be our special guest next week. Uh, but for now, it's mailbag time. So you ready, Bill? I'm ready. Let's start with let's start with Jeff Cohen. Um, Jeff is an avid listener. He messaged me today on uh, a big get with uh, Terry Collins. He's got a baseball and BBQ podcast. Totally recommend it. Highly recommend it. Uh, he's got a question for both of us, Bill. We'll start with you. Bill, uh, can you give us a little insight? After a rough inning, what did you and your catcher discuss in the dugout afterwards? Is it strategy or something else? Um, it can be multiple things. I think a, a lot of times it'll be, uh, you know, pitch location, the catch where you, you know, you might go over where you th might've thought a pitch was and the catcher has a little better idea of where the pitch might've been, uh, pitch selection, you know, 
um, talking about your tempo in between pitches, you know, whether you needed to take a little bit more time or try to speed things up a little bit. It's a multitude of things, but I would say mostly it's about, you know, pitch selection, pitch location, and then um, what the catch, because I always, I like to trust the catcher a lot because he's the close, the guy standing the closest to the, to the hitter and a good catcher. And I'll use uh, Alberto Castillo as a, as a, as an example, he would always, you know, when you're looking in, you would always see him kind of peeking, you know, peeking up or looking down at feet and all that. So um, it's just, you know, discussing pitch, pitch selection, pitch location, and then strategy, you know, how you want to go, how you want to go after somebody the next time you go around. And now you, uh, we see the iPads in the dugout. They can actually see what just transpired, which is right. an advantage. Instead of having so, to run into the, into the, the clubhouse. Right, right. I mean, I'm not a huge ru- fan of guys sitting on the, on the iPad in between because I like you to be involved in the game, but obviously you can see a lot more uh, through yeah. video than you can through trying to go through just memory alone. Not for everybody, you know, but J.D. Martinez is one of those guys. He'll be on that iPad right after an at-bat just seeing what he just... Well, he's got nothing else to do. <laughs> That's DHs would not like to hear that, but you're you're right. <laughs> All right, Jeff uh, Cohen has a question for Casey. That's me, Casey. Since you're in the media, what do you think of the coverage by Fox and ESPN for the London series? Um, I'm not a fan of Fox or ESPN when it comes to baseball coverage. Um, I hate, and I'm gonna. I don't like using the word hate, so I'll. I'll uh, but I'm going to use it when they interview players during the game. Can't stand. Well, I can't. Just like Bill said, I can't stand it. Uh, uh, you know, a, a ground ball to Francisco Lindor, literally like on the first pitch while he's mic'd up. I can't stand it. And as a viewer, I I, I want to watch the game. And you have half and half screen this, half screen that. You know, Fox interviews everybody. ESPN is worse. So to answer your question, Jeff. I thought of the coverage of the series because it's Fox and ESPN. Uh, I would give it a, a D minus. That's what I would give. I don't think I you like, should have uh, Michael K covering a Mets game at any point in time. Don't go there. Especially oh, in a man. situation like that, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I agree. I tell you what. I think the mic'd up thing is kind of making a mockery of the sport and whatever sport it is at the highest level. This is the highest peak peak level of the of, of a profession. And to have somebody doing an interview while they're out there trying to play at the peak level, I think it's ridiculous. It is. It, it, <clears throat> and, you know, and I get at, at like, there's a little anxiety. Like, you know, they're, they're, like you said, it's the peak. It's the major leagues. And they're into every pitch. I, I, I don't even know why players would agree to do it. I, don't, I, I, I found out why. I found Please, out why. If you could say it. Regular season is ten grand. Postseason is fifteen <sighs> grand. if you get mic'd up. Wow. I always thought, yeah. obviously, money, but the hearing it's is money. confirmed. It's got to be. I don't understand why. I mean, look, and the superstars have done it. Bryce Harper has done it. And Bryce well, Harper's. Su- a- it's, it's always the superstars. So you're telling me that Francisco Lindor, who's making $50,000 a freaking at bat, you know, 15000 for being mic'd up a half an inning? I mean, I get it, but money always know. wins. Okay. I don't get it. I don't get it because I know if I'm a pitcher and I know that my shortstop. And I guess it was two weeks ago that one of the Dodgers made an error uh, yeah. while he was mic'd up. And then uh, the manager didn't even know that he was mic'd up. If I'm the manager and I know that the guy made an error while he's over there jibber-jabbering with the uh, yeah. with the guys up top, I think that that's, that's something you, that I would put a stop to. Can you repeat it? What was it, 10000 for what? 10000 for a regular season, 15000 for a postseason game. Unbelievable. You know, they yep. started with the in-game manager interviews, but they weren't in-game. They were between innings. Right, between innings, which I'm okay. still not even a fan of that. But well, hey. It was better. And they, they slowly evolved to literally a guy going back as an outfielder to the fence to make a catch while talking to Michael Kay or Carl Ravitch. It's, yeah. you know, I don't want to be all boomer here, and I'm not. I, it's just, <laughs> I haven't found one person who enjoys it. You know? I don't know. To me, like everybody has ADD, pretty pretty damn bad nowadays. That's an ADD yeah. thing to me. Like, I need to focus on this game right now because baseball. Sure, there's downtime and all that, but you never know when that ball is going to, going to be hit to you. Right. And when it is hit to you, you better be freaking ready to go get the ball. <clears throat> yeah, you're absolutely right. So, good question, <clears throat> Jeff. Check out his podcast, uh, Baseball and BBQ. Uh, let's go with our boy JK at NYMGI. He's got a question for you, Bill. All right. Bill, I saw you're doing a card show in August. 
I've heard some stories over the years of players and promoters having huge fights in the back without names. Obviously, have you ever witnessed anything crazy at a card show? <laughs> Other than the – no, I'm not going to say. That's that's terrible. No names needed. And I guess you are uh, – so you're having a card show in August if you want to publicize it for yourself. I'm doing a card show in White Plains. Um, I can't even remember what day it is. It's somewhere – it's a Saturday <laughs> in August, August 17th or something like that. If that's a Saturday, it's that day. It's so far away from me, I haven't even started right. thinking about it. Um, for the question, I th- – to be honest with you, I did card shows early on in my career when I was a hot topic – and then I didn't do a card show for, it has to be 25 plus years. And wow. I, just did a, I just did a card show in um, Virginia Beach a few weeks back, probably a month ago now. Uh, first one I've done as a post, as a retired player. And it was all cordial. You know, I, I've never seen anything crazy. I did hear some crazy stories early on about some of the stuff that went on in old school WWF. Because one of the guys that was a promoter was a was a promoter for WWF, and he told me some some of the crazy stories uh, that I won't like won't repeat or use names like uh, uh, it, and JK asked us to, but I personally me no I, I try to I try to be cordial with everybody, and I'm not yeah. looking to start any beef. You know, I haven't seen anybody else do that either. YouTube has it. I uh, I don't know if you saw this once, Darren Dalton who was battling cancer at the time, hmm. had to get in the middle in the back of, I believe it was Lenny Dykstra and Mitch right. Williams. You know, well, there you go. Yeah. 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 Imagine that. Um, uh, and it's on YouTube and you know, there, there was shit going on, you Listen, know, I'm a, I'm a character. I definitely a character. Uh, I believe Lenny and Mitch might probably have me be. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, so thank you for the question, N-Y-M-G-I-J-K. Uh, let's get to two more. Uh, let's go with uh, a new guy. Uh, welcome to the show, Homer Monroe. I, <laughs> don't, I don't know if that's his real name, but his at is uh, J-Z or, yeah, J-Z uh, Jones 2000. So he's got a question, I guess, for both of us. I'd like to stay away from these questions, but I thought about it, so I'll comment as well. Pete Alonso was supposedly offered seven years for one hundred fifty-eight million. He wants eight and two hundred. Do you think the years of eight is more important, or just the total amount of money? Seven years at one fifty-eight is basically one eighty if you extend extend it to eight years. They don't seem too far off. Maybe eight years. And 185 would make sense. I'll go first with this one. Yeah, yeah. When that supposed offer was made, he did not have David Stearns. At, uh, he did not have Scott Boris as his agent. And David Stearns was not a part of that contract offer. So, because it was rumored that it was Billy Epler. And that obviously was before David Stearns, who was hired October 5th. And that was before Scott Boris. So I could easily just say the question is no, because who's in charge now? David Stearns. Those he offers didn't don't really that, exist. <laughs> it, that offer, you know. Doesn't really he, exist. It, exactly. He didn't take it if it's true. And it doesn't really exist because David Stearns is in charge. And we don't know how he will operate this offseason. So well, I, well, what I will say with Pete Alonso is if that's true um, with the money, listen, he bet on himself, just like Aaron Judge, just like Blake Snell, you know, just like everybody. The, the, not everybody, but people bet on themselves. There's a long season to go, right? It would kill me to see Pete in another uniform, obviously, even if he was traded and came back, just for two months seeing him in another uniform. It doesn't but seem that, right. <laughs> it just doesn't. Homegrown, you know, he would already beat Daryl's record for home runs, if not for the COVID year. But as for the question from Homer oh, Monroe, um, I, the the question is no, because David Stearns was not a part of that offer. But to answer you, and here's where I guess the question we can answer: as a player, do we think it's the years or the money that's more important? Yeah, right? that's what I was gonna. That's where I was leaning towards and giving my answer. Um, as somebody that played till he was 37 myself, obviously not in the major leagues, 
when you when you're a, a passionate passionate baseball player you always think about i want to play till this age or i want to play for this long so i would think that quite possibly the years might be important just to know that i've got another year of contract down so i can go that much further into my career because i think that pete sees himself as a long-term baseball player i don't think that he thinks you know 10 years and i'm done i think he's thinking 20 years i want to play 20 years of major league baseball i think he thinks that so um i would say that having that extra year locked up is means something to him i would think i don't know i could well, be wrong i mean obviously money talks and bullshit walks but knowing that i have another year and as long as major league baseball contracts are guaranteed i got another year i got well, another year i know i'm going to be around for another year getting paid Here's the thing, though. At that and, point and, in time, the money is irrelevant. It's money. You're, you're generational rich. <clears throat> yeah. So here, here's the thing. That contract, whether it's true or not, and Joel Sherman reported this, and I trust Joel Sherman with the post. He's, <clears throat> he's reliable. Um, that seven-year offer by Billy Epler back in, let's say, the summer of 23, they were buying out his last year of arbitration, which is this year. So it really just was a six-year extension. Six yeah. Right. So think about it that way. But it's no. David Stern's in charge. Um, I think it's all a fresh, fresh, fresh slate, clean slate. We're starting yeah. from scratch. Yeah. And I do think Pete is pressing. Um, but, you know, he, he he who he was batting second for the last month. Who was protecting him? Brandon Nimmo, who is now in a slump. Brandon Nimmo, because they moved Lindor to the leadoff spot. Brandon Nimmo's a leadoff hitter. Yes, he is. So stop you telling, put Pete, you know, stop right. beep, boop, bop, beep, beep, bloop, and trying to figure out your lineups. Guys are positions in where they play, and that's what they do, and that's what right. Brandon Nimmo is a leadoff hitter. Brandon here, Nimmo doesn't want the pressure of being a number three hole hitter. Right, but anything Brandon for, Nimmo likes to start things off. I can take pitches. I don't have to worry about always trying to drive runners in. I can just worry about getting on base. Yep. I always thought Brandon Nimmo was the quintessential leadoff hitter. Like Other than the, he didn't steal bases. Other than that, right. you know, he, was, did, he, he saw pitches, he worked counts, he yeah. got on base. <laughs> but, That's what you want. But it's they sacrificed Nimmo for Lindor because Lindor got moved up to the leadoff spot where he thrived in Cleveland. He's doing well there. But look what's happened. Nimmo is in a slump. He didn't start in the lineup on Wednesday. And they move back Pete to batting fourth on Wednesday. It's musical chairs. It's the deck of chairs on the Titanic, you know, of just let's move Pete to two, to four. You put <clears throat> Pete Alonzo, and I'm going to go to the grave with this. Not, I will. You put Pete Alonzo in a Phillies lineup with guys who can protect him, he'll hit, he'll hit, he's a different player. We know the power. We know he's, he can hit 265, 270. He's a career 250 hitter. It's just he's got no one protecting him, you know. Yeah. Nimmo's, and we've we've talked yeah. about it before. He feels the pressure of having to be the guy to drive uh, drive people in and hit home runs, and that's when you see him swinging at the bad sliders off the plate, Absolutely. you know, and, and waving at pitches and, and having bad swings. Because I think that he, you know, he doesn't feel like he's going to get a lot of pitches to hit. So I totally agree with what you're saying. You put him in another lineup somewhere, and he might be a different player. Yeah, I absolutely uh, exactly. So good question, and I appreciate it, Homer. No, no. Can you get no. better than me? There you go. No. Much better. Oh, well, that was good. Uh, thank you for the question, Homer. Uh, we got one more question, Bill. Uh, he he wrote in last week. Um, Jake twelve eight eight nine, and we just talked about this actually, but we in. didn't go into detail. For both of you, haven't heard your thoughts on the whole Jorge Lopez saga. Might have missed it. What is your take on it? So I don't think we actually did talk about the saga, if Not you will. Not on the pod, yeah. Um, but he did sign a minor league contract on Wednesday, he'll, and he'll be up with the Cubs. you know. Uh, but I don't think we did talk about what happened. So no. if you want to take it first, be my uh, guest. Look, I mean, a, a unique, crazy situation. Uh, obviously, the baseball, like life, is, is emotional, and it was an emotional situation. Uh I'll give him a, a 10 out of 10 for doing th something that uh, we never saw before. You know, a guy, and I, I, I as a guy that I, I will say this in, a, in bullpen sessions where I've struggled, I might've thrown my, thrown my glove out of the bullpen into the stands, but I, we've never seen somebody actually throw their glove into, <laughs> into the stands like that. So 
10 out of 10 for um, originality. Um, <laughs> unfortunate situation. I don't know. You know, I think the guy was probably frustrated. I heard some things about mis- misunderstanding yeah. whether he said we're the worst team or we suck. But, I mean, multiple people have said that. So I think that there was – and the fact that it took a little while for him to get picked up, maybe there was a little bit of uh, animosity towards him doing the, the glove into the stands thing. But uh, <sighs> you yeah. gotta watch. What you, you gotta watch what you say when you're not. Um, well, if you're not the, the high paid superstar guy, I guess. And I'm not saying that any of the high paid superstar guys have said anything negative about the ball club because that's not the case. But uh, it's strange who can who can do and who can say and who can't. You know, yeah. it's it's unfortunate. Well, you know, he threw the glove into the uh, into the stands after he, I believe it was a, a, a Otani home run, which happens a lot. But what I think got him DFA'd was not he double he lied. Basically, he said that he didn't meet with Stearns and Mendoza to the media, in which he did meet with them. Um, well, maybe he the, thought that that was he. Did, you know, maybe he thought he shouldn't speak about behind closed doors. Right. Thing, you know, <laughs> but he was. Um, and this is where I get annoyed with this. Spanish is his native language. Right. English is his second language. Right. They have interpreters. He did not have an interpreter there. Why? I don't know. But they had a closed door I, meeting. You know what? Is somebody that speaks two languages? Maybe he wanted to use his, his, his ability. That's fine. You know? That's fine. But my point is it got taken out. He said what we all th- heard what we thought we heard which was, I am on the worst fucking team in the league. But what he actually said, if you listen, because it's not his native language in English, was, I am I think I'm the worst teammate, teammate on the worst team. Right. That changes everything. Yeah. And the Mets had no choice at that point, you know. But it was a miscommunication. Well, that's why I think you just have to have an interpreter there, just in case. Just in case. Because it costs him his job. Um, but – that's my take on it, and you know, I wish him luck. He's got a sick child um, who needs Oof. a transplant. Um, you know, well, and- I mean, you, you add that in there into it as well. That, that that his frustration level was probably extremely high with the team struggling, him struggling a little bit. You add a sick child in, and that man probably has a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And, and the last thing about this, and Jorge Lopez aside, and I, I, I hope his his child gets better and gets that transplant. Baseball players, as you know, because you were in the major leagues and baseball is all your life, you guys, you know, fans don't realize that it's a job, you know, like, and there's other things in the world at, for baseball players. Bill, who played in the major leagues, what, what are you, the 20,000 of, you know, three and a half billion people? Uh, males or 7 billion people, you know, t- uh, whatever the percentage is. But, like, the, the, you can't just think that you go home and think about baseball 24-7. You got to unwind. You, there's other things in your life. Baseball players are human. Jorge Lopez has a sick child. XYZ player has maybe a divorce going on or this going on. They're humans. So maybe to your point, yeah, he was hot. You know, giving up a home run, his child is on his mind. We got to cut some slack to players as fans. We got to take a step back sometimes, and I'm guilty of it too. We all, you know? are. we all, right? Are. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it takes stories like that. We didn't know that he has a sick child, and then puts everything in perspective. Yeah. So, thank you for the question, Jake. Um, great questions as always. Shay underscore hello. Uh, we will put that o- out over the weekend. For Terry Collins, who will be our next guest next week on episode 38. We are going to move to quick pitches. And as everybody knows, three rapid questions to Bill Pulsifer. Doesn't know what's coming. Doesn't have to be about baseball. Never is, actually. Let's Let's see what we got in store for Bill. You ready, Bill? I'm ready. Question one. What celebrity would you pick to be your best friend for the rest of your life? I mean, I've had to use this name a couple of times already. Oh, Will, I know the answer. Will, Will Ferrell. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. As soon as Can I, I asked Chris you. Chris Farley, if he was still alive, Farley would have yeah, been a yeah. good one too. But Absolutely. I'll go with Farley. God, you know, may he rest in peace. But um, right. Will Will would be a, a fun guy to hang out with uh, yeah. as well. I, 
<clears throat> I asked, you know, who would you want playing it? You in a movie and Will Ferrell. Uh, reading it out loud, I was like, ah, Will Ferrell. Well, the, Chris like, the word that I would make up, right, was scrum trelescent, which was a yep. Will Ferrell, but then, which I, I did switch to uh, after through text with uh, stick to itiveness, which yeah. is another word that should be in the dictionary. I, I literally had to Google that, and it took moments of my life, and I thank you for that. <laughs> 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 Question two. If you had to relocate to another country, if you were forced, what uh -huh. country would it be and why? You're gone from America. We don't, you're oh, forced man. to leave. I mean, I'm going to go, go with somewhere that I spend a lot of time. Uh, Puerto Rico would be a nice place. I mean, I'm, I don't like the heat all that much during the, the hot, hot times of the year, but um, I like Puerto like, Rico. I spent a lot of time okay. in Puerto Rico as well. So I would know the area, know the place as well. It wouldn't be completely new to me. Yeah. Okay. Why would I, I go there? Because I, like I said, I know, I know the, I know the area. I know the island. I've spent a lot of time on the island. I enjoy the the culture. I enjoy the people. I love the food. Yep. Um, that would be a good place to, to relocate. I respect all of that, and definitely the food. Although Spanish hurricanes, food. though, hurricanes would be something you'd have to worry about. They've been hit. Yeah. And numerous like right times. now, it's June. It's hurricane season. You know, starting in Florida. You know, in the Caribbean. Things only uh, seem to be getting worse when it comes to that, unfortunately. Yeah. Last question. If someone, hypothetically, and I hope this happens to you, gave okay. you a billion, a bill, Ian dollars, no pun mm -hmm. intended, what would be the first couple things you do with it? That's a really good question. Um, I would a pay billion all, dollars. Yeah, billion. well, I would make sure that I have no debt. I would make sure that nobody in my family has any debt. Uh, I would probably buy a really nice new sports car and maybe be a uh, a bigger sports utility type vehicle. Okay. Uh, maybe move to Puerto Rico. Oh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Relocate. Uh, a billion I would dollars? definitely, yeah. I would give, I would find a charity that I really, really believed in, and I would give some money to charity, uh, whether it be you know sick children, homelessness, um, mental health. You know, I would try to to give back uh, to those that are less fortunate. If I was to to get a billion dollars, um, yeah, those would be the things I would do first. I like it all, especially the charity part, and uh, you know the debt part because people are struggling out there with that, with you know everything just out of whack right now in the country. So, uh, good answers. That was a Thank good you. session of uh, quick pitches. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button at Shea Hello Media. Uh, before we wrap up, Bill, anything you would like to say um, before we uh, we get out of here? Just like always, you know, we appreciate appreciate everybody, everybody that tunes in, everybody that sends in questions. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, keep it up. Uh, stay positive. Hopefully the the guys over these next 30 games, hopefully the, the ball club makes it interesting yeah, for us. This month is big for the Mets. Our next episode, we will have the longest tenured Met manager in history, Terry Collins. Again, hit that subscribe button. Turn the noties on. Uh, look out on X for Shea underscore hello, where we're going to ask our fans, our listeners, to ask Terry Collins, whatever you want. That would um, be good. So we are definitely looking forward to next episode, episode 38, where Terry Collins will be our next guest. Uh, for Stephen White, our producer, uh, and my co-host, Bill Postifer, my name is Casey Lynn saying so long from the Shea Low podcast until next week.